Hello, everyone. I'm Janet Salmons, Methods Guru for Sage Method Space. And I'm joined here today by Rob Kozinets, and he's an ethnographic shaman. So we're bound to have a good conversation about online research. So before we get started, if you are new to Method Space, um, this is a blog community hosted by Sage Publishing that is about everything to do with designing, conducting, analyzing research, writing about it, and sharing results in conventional and new ways. And you can see at the heart of this Venn diagram, we have teaching and learning, because we think that whether you are a student or an experienced researcher, we all have something to learn. So um, Rob, why don't you begin by introducing yourself? Yeah, it's a good, it's a good place to start. So I, yeah, I'm, I'm a student of the internet, Janet, and I'm a student of yours as well. And I was mentioning before we turn on the, um, the microphones uh, and started recording them that, uh, that I've used your work and, and your texts for many years in my own teaching and my own learning and, and thinking about and certainly cite you plenty of times in, in my textbooks. I'm, um, I'm, a, I'm a professor at the University of Southern California. Uh, um, I have a cross appointment in the communication school in the marketing mm -hmm. uh, uh, school in the business school, which is Marshall. And I guess I would say that my career has kind of been one of a crossing boundaries. I started mm -hmm. as a PhD student in the marketing department and also did a PhD at the same time in organizational research because we had to do these co PhDs mm -hmm. and then decided to study media fans uh, and pick that up with one of the top cultural studies scholars uh, who became my mentor and now my colleague, Henry Jenkins. Um, and mm -hmm. I've spent a lot of my time sort of um, not necessarily crossing boundaries, but I would just say ignoring them, looking at <laughs> problems and issues that seem to be right. important and interesting, and then trying to figure out ways to, to answer them and to study them. So for example, when I started out studying media fans, and it was uh, it started initially in the Star Trek fan community. Um, I found out that in the 19 mid 1990s, when I was studying them, that they were using uh, the internet extensively to talk about mm -hmm. their fandom and things that mattered to them. And that if I didn't include some of those conversations and some of that activity, that I was missing out on a lot of really great data that was. I mean, mm -hmm. okay, it was it was pre collected for me. It was right. transcribed. It was sorted. It was titled. It had subject lines. There were long threads, uh, you, you know, about them. And and I looked at this stuff, and I looked at a, a few people were doing things like this, like mm -hmm. Nancy Bayham and Henry Jenkins and people. They were all in, in communications, as far as I could tell. Um, and I tried to figure out what it was they were doing and explain it to people in my own native field, which was marketing and consumer research. And they were very intrigued, not only by what I was finding, but how I was finding it. Mm -hmm. So I started getting a lot of questions about how do you do this. What are the rules? What's right. what's what's new here? And right. this is you know uh, in a field that has a few anthropologists and sociologists and has a uh, I would not say a huge but a strong and high quality tradition of doing ethnographic work. So uh, you know I kind of found myself at these different different boundary positions, uh, and that's I guess how I would describe myself is kind of a a boundary spanning mm -hmm. rainmaker, and I use the term shaman. Uh, kind of <laughs> apologetically, uh, you know, uh, to counter your, your guru-ness. Um, so that's how I would describe myself. I'm kind of somebody who's really interested in topics uh, and then has had to invent tools in order to, right. to, to study them uh, a little bit better. But I'm really, I'm, I have to say, you know, I'm known for somebody who developed netnography and has been talking about it so almost ad nauseum for 20 years to, you know, mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I'm not tired of it completely yet, but I'm more interested in what you can discover with netnography mm -hmm. and the, the theory building and the things that can be illuminated uh, using these kind of, of approaches than I am necessarily in the tool itself. However, for other people to join in that part of me, I found that I have to come up with some sort of description. Right. And uh, so, you know, you get 450 pages of goodness after 20 years of figuring that out. Right. So, well, first of all, I think I had a similar experience. I, I was actually studying um, collaboration and collaborative learning, but I did 
people in my interviews as my data collection because back then it was I was an early adopter for doing webinars. And you know, I knew that I wanted to interview people around the world. And I was thinking, well, I don't have the money to go traveling around the world. So how am I going to do this? And I went, aha, why can't I use this webinar technology to do interviews? And then of course I started doing all the kinds of visual interactions you can do using this kind of technology. But I thought that I would be going on and, and spending my time talking about collaboration, which I have you know, done a lot of work in that and I've published books on that topic. But anytime I would talk with people about my research, before I could get to what it was I studied, when I talk about the interviews, they'd go like, stop, stop, stop. How did you do that? Is there anything written about that? Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, we became methodologists out of, um, out of the need to, to figure it yeah. out. It's really interesting. I think we have been on parallel paths because, you know, my first conference I presented my, my Star Trek stuff and I ended up, you know, coining a term ethnography to talk about what I was doing. And, you know, most of the questions I got were like, more, more, give me more on that, give me more on that. And so the next year I wrote more. And then, you know, I, I met some editors in my, in my job and they were like, write about the methodology part. I, we could, we could do something with that. And so I didn't necessarily think, oh, I have a grand vision of this. It was, I was pulled along. It sounds like your story was similar. People were very right. curious about how did you do it? How did you do it? Because there really was a need in the nineties for, for people who are out there sort of experimenting in this this you know a brave new frontier world where, where there really weren't you know a lot of people writing about how you do this stuff. Right. It really came a lot later. I mean, I think the, the first people who did an ethnography and published it were like ten years after I I had started doing it. It took a long, long time for there right. to be any uptake at all. Um, right. So I was kind of a you know voice in the wilderness for a, a long time. Right. Right. Well, talk about how netnography grew out of your thinking about ethnography. Yeah, thank you. And how, those, question, Janet. how the how it compares and contrasts with other kinds of online ethnographies. Yeah, okay. So so I mean my thinking about ethnography was very much formed in my in my PhD years by exposure to the classics, right? You know, Margaret Mead and uh, Bronislaw Malinowski and these versions of the ethnographer who is an anthropologist getting on a boat, you know, sailing for, for three weeks or so and coming to Bora Bora or wherever and living right. with some native group of, you know, uh, let's call them organic communities, right? Communities that lived close to the earth and so on, had very different rituals and customs from what we knew in Western civilization. And they were they were they were sort of studying and almost preserving these communities, which mm -hmm. most of them don't exist in those forms anymore. And they were doing it in a way that seemed very, for lack of a better word, pure, right? This was ethnography. And I started to call this organic, uh, sorry, analog ethnography. Mm -hmm. It's analog ethnography, right? It's, it's, it's ethnography that doesn't really use any technological tools. These people didn't have tape recorders. They were writing in their field notes. They yeah. were wearing their pith helmets. You know, they were going to, to, to local weddings and funerals and so on. And I think that's really, um, captured the popular imagination, right? Mm -hmm. Jane Goodall, Diane Fossey, you know, they, 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 they're, they're not highly technological uh, uh, ethnographers. They go out into the bush with field notes, maybe with a, a, a little camera and they take some pictures. But what we, what we miss in that story is that ethnography has been changing um, and it's been growing and it's been adapted to so many different fields. Ethnography changed when we brought cameras in. Ethnography changed when we brought tape recorders in. Ethnography changed when everybody in the places we were studying had a telephone and we could call them up after we got back and ask them some questions and maintain that relationship. I think maybe we did a little bit of that with, with letters and so on too, but we, those, mm -hmm. we really downplayed the technology because mm -hmm. anthropology was really playing up the, 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 um, you know, the, the, the pre-colonial, let's call it primitive. I don't like the word, but less, technologically developed right. societies. That was really the, the allure of, of, of this form of analog ethnography. But the truth is that ethnography has really changed and involved more and more technology until the people that were studying, like if you look at the Yano uh, Mami Indians in Brazil, they're shooting and, and editing their own uh, video and sharing it on social media. I mean, this is 
a rainforest tribe that has sort of been held up as mm -hmm. you know one of the most pristine human cultures on earth and they're editing they're digitally editing their own video and posting it on instagram it's there is those cultures don't exist anymore and yet i think a lot of uh anthropologists and pe pretty much people who use ethnography still act as if you could think about human culture without mm -hmm. deeply involving technology in what we do mm -hmm. and so you know uh as I, I didn't really, you know, I came to this over, over thinking about this for many years, but I did know that there were a lot of varieties of ethnography. For example, in my dissertation work, I wrote about experimental ethnography. I've done a lot of work with video ethnography and videography. I'm familiar mm -hmm. with things like, you know, post-structural ethnography and feminist ethnography, uh, you know, and, and every field that uses ethnography sort of adapts it. I just wrote a chapter for, um, a book on organizational ethnography. Everyone is sort of bringing this in. So, so ethnography always seem, seems to be moderated by something. Uh, and so uh, I think around the 19, late 1980s, people started to do ethnographies of the uh, communications that people were sharing online and calling them online ethnographies. So they were really using whatever was being uh, shared in those communications mm -hmm. online and oftentimes they were casting this as communities, online communities, and they were sort of entering into one site. Oh, let's do the, you know, the, the, the lesbian bar on CompuServe or whatever it is, and let's write about that. So there were these sort of, you know, let's talk about the soap opera community mm -hmm. like Nancy Bayham did and so on, or, you know, Twin Peaks fans as Henry Jenkins did. And they jump into one community and study it as if it was like Bora Bora as if it was this field site, right? But, you know, so it was still sort of constrained by the model of what ethnography, ideal ethnography was, but they were now saying, oh, it can be, it can be using these communications in a way that's cultural, uh, in a way that sort of does this. So, so there was this tension that started to come in with, with online ethnography to think about what is it that uh, is ethnographic and how can we bring that to what is clearly not a physical field site, but is a sort of repository of these communications where people, uh, mm -hmm. you know, sh share messages with each other, vi video and, and or sorry, visuals and sometimes video and so on as as it started to get going. So this general category of online ethnography used the content that was online in a way that was ethnographic, mm -hmm. and that was originally how I thought about ethnography. Was going to focus mainly on what happened online, and it would be an adjunct to the physical ethnography that I was doing at things like. Uh, Star Trek conventions and fan club meetings and so on. Mm -hmm. Other people started to write about about similar things, right? So, you know, one of the earlier ones being Christine Hine, who wrote about virtual ethnography. And for virtual ethnography, she basically thought about um, this online communication as being sort of partial. It was virtual. It wasn't quite as real as the physical part. So again, this notion that, the, you know, that the organic, uh, sorry, that the analog ethnography mm -hmm. was sort of the, you know, the, the core ethnography, mm -hmm. right, and that anything else was sort of watering it down. Uh, this notion of a digital anthropology, Sarah Pink later wrote about this, anything, you know, that involves the digital world and the way people adapt to the digital world, whether it is their online communications or, or, or just looking at how they use their cell phone or how they move mm -hmm. their body when they're typing and looking at a screen, all of these things would fit into an ethnographic approach that looked at how the digital was changing. That. So these sort of broader conceptions that brought in embodiment as well. Whereas netnography sort of followed a slightly different path, which was to really think about um, how do we use social media content, uh, these texts, these communications and so on, in a way that is true as much as possible to the spirit of ethnography and being ethnographic without necessarily itself having to be strictly an analog type of ethnography. It's a different thing. It's a, I call it a post-analog ethnography. You know, we're moving to these other forms of ethnography, which can sort of slot in, just like, you know, we say we did an ethnography and we did interviews and we did some documentary analysis. I see, you know, thinking about um, uh, how we studied the online communications of people as being a netnographic component. It could be a standalone or it could be part of a, a, a wider project. The key part here is that the rules were unclear. So we needed a new sort of set of guidelines and rules to handle things like the massive amounts of data, the fact that we're working on search engines, the fact that we don't own the tools of these trade, but they're, you know, these are social media platforms that are owned by other people. 
And there are huge ethics issues that you don't have in person. You've got, you know, I, I tell my students, you got a Harry Potter invisibility cloak when you go out there as a netnographer. What are you gonna do with that and how can you use it? Do you have to ask informed content, for example, when you download someone's data off of a, off of a public site? How about if it's a private site? What then? Uh, what about if you've just done, done, you know, exchanged a couple of words in a chat window? Uh, do you need to disclose yourself? Do you need to get informed consent? What form should that inform consent? So ethnography didn't have answers to these questions. Right. The traditional forms of ethnography didn't know because you know, most ethnographers spend a lot of time writing in their little field note, uh, field, uh, field notes in their field journals, trying to get data. Whereas you know, I could sit down and, and download you know, millions of words in a, in a half hour. I mean, that's right. getting data was no problem, right? That was the easy part. It was what do you do after that that was hard. So the challenges were almost reversed. But what stayed behind was the sense of studying culture, understanding cultural sensibilities, trying mm -hmm. to understand this as an immersed, uh, involved scholar, uh, trying to understand some aspect of the human experience mm -hmm. in the way that the people who are involved in it do, rather mm -hmm. than the way a, a search engine or an AI would do. So it was a big question you asked that gave you, I'm sorry, a big long answer. Yeah. So, you know, since you've been doing this for a while, how, how have your ideas about it changed? I know that your book has gotten bigger. Yeah. So what, what are the additional kinds of things that, that you felt it was important to include and, and kind of help researchers think through in their own studies? Sure. Well, you know, I mean, there have been a lot of adaptations. I mean, initially when I thought about um, netnography, I thought it, uh, I talked about it as participant observation uh, in, in an online space or studying mm -hmm. an online community or culture. And that's really changed because the notion of what participation is is not at all clear to people and it's become increasingly unclear to me and I don't use that terminology anymore. The idea of focusing on a particular online culture or community is also equally sort of, um, and, and not uh, something that's as bounded as, as it once was. Right. So, you know, and part of the reason is because this online um, arena of communications has changed a lot. I mean, when right. I started studying, there were, I don't know, there were something like 50 million people all together around the world who were online. Mm -hmm. It's somewhere around four to five billion now. I mean, there's almost no one is not online. At that time, it was a very different feeling a very different group and we had a much more limited set of platforms and their affordances you know now i've got to write you know if i'm going to write a new edition i'm going to have to include a lot more on tiktok because a lot of people are using tiktok now uh i'm gonna to have to talk about clubhouse which didn't even exist when i wrote uh, mm -hmm. this latest version of the book i'm gonna to to talk about discord uh you know and things are falling by the wayside like periscope and you know um so Netnography is changing because the social media field is changing so rapidly. So people need to know, well, how do I how do I do something like look at Snapchat, right? So when I wrote initially about um, uh, news groups, which were all textual, uh, there there was you know there was no way that I could talk about taking screenshots on your mobile phone and saving those, downloading them to some sort of repository. On Google Drive or on, on your computer, and then using those as as your data, set, you know, mm -hmm. data in your data set, because it didn't exist. This notion of you know the ephemerality. Now with Clubhouse and podcasts, we have different sets of challenges, right. um, and you know, using YouTube data and so on. And then the rights issues become. This is a minefield that people uh, step mm -hmm. into. So every time you've got a change. And then you've got new rules, right? You've got these GDPR regulations. Well, that wasn't there the second edition or first edition of my book. And mm -hmm. all that had to be added in. So it's a, you know, this area is developing so quickly in society that I'm, you know, and other scholars are racing to keep up mm -hmm. and try and figure out, uh, right. you know, what we should do, how we adapt to it. Plus, and, uh, you, know, uh, you know, when it comes to netnography, business people are using netnography too. And so they're coming up with their own innovations. They're bringing AI to this. And some of the things that they're doing, I think are amazing. And some of the other things I think they're doing are sort of counter to some of the spirit of, of the way that I've envisioned metnography. And I wanna be part of that discussion too. 
So, you know, there's a, there's a lot going on in the real world. And if we want to study it and understand it, then our methods have to keep up. And so that's really where it comes as well. You know, I'm rethinking things like, what does it mean to say that some group of people who are posting content online is a community? Does it make sense to think about them as a community? What, what's communal about them? Or is this something else, something different? And we're just, we've been lazily using old metaphors to mm -hmm. describe new realities. And we're bumping up at this point with some of the limitations that's giving us in, in, in order to be right. able to conceptualize and see this new world as it is rather than through the frame of something that's no right. longer there. Well, like you say, I mean, just the, the nature of how things operate online where, you know, it used to be that we might have, you know, an, an online community around you know, a topic like adopting technology in nonprofit organizations or something like that. And you would, you would have, you know, the content that, that is, you know, available to the people who have logged in and registered and joined that group. And it's, you know, maybe not entirely the, the uh, idea of a walled garden, but, you know, pretty yeah. closed and that it's obvious that you have entered it and that you've entered into a group of people who are regular participants. And I'm not saying that doesn't happen anymore yeah. because I think that, that that does happen. And in, you know, there are particular, you know, professional groups and, and groups that, that maybe are even invisible to the online researcher who, who is not a member of the organization yeah. or something like that. I mean, you're not going to get into you know, an AA group, for example, an Alcoholics Anonymous or something like that, a therapy group or something where you really would have that sense of online community of regular attendance by the same members who are engaged in very personal discussions. Those may be happening in a more, you know, very much a private, you know, kind of space. Whereas the other kinds of things that the more general it's it's just it's diffuse across multiple platforms and not you know within say you know if I if I post to uh, Twitter you know the, uh, you know to some extent I interact with a lot of the same people over and over again but you know it's kind of random I mean who, who it is you couldn't really you know it'd be hard to describe that as a community so the the sensibility of yeah. the ethnographic sense of I am an outsider going into a, a community to study it using certain techniques is just, I think, less, See, less I, common. Well, yeah, I, but, but I think your example, the AE is, AA one is a perfect example because um, that would be something that an, a netnographer might do is write, for example, what would be being called auto netnographies, where if you are an alcoholic and you have been online and you have been a member of these particular mm. groups that might be hard to access if you weren't, um, writing about that in an ethnographic way as someone who is deeply involved, I won't say participant observer, but it's, you know, in those mm. cases, the analog uh, really works. The, you know, the alternate is you, you sort of stay at a distance and download a bunch of data and don't understand what it means. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's not really that's not really very ethnographic, um, mm -hmm. which is why I think most people who do this uh, method um, are studying things that they already know something about. They're mm -hmm. deepening their knowledge. They're going to right. sites. They're working with topics that they're already familiar with. One of a former PhD student of mine now who is in the military, and she's writing about uh, you know, military female self-representations on Instagram. She ha doesn't have a big Instagram profile, but she's, she really knows uh, military culture and from the perspective of a woman having, having been mm -hmm. in it. And I'm talking about obviously US military culture. Um, but that allows her to really decode a lot of what's going mm -hmm. on in the visuals, in the hashtags, in the description. And it gives her an in to interview mm -hmm. these women. Because that's the other part we haven't talked about is, is that netnography does not just stop at the door of downloading content. It also steps in, into that world and interviews people where required by the research question. It doesn't mm -hmm. have to. So, you know, when we talk about steps and stages, 
it starts off with a research question, but then there are three data collection, what I call movements. The first one is immersion, where the, the researcher is involved in uh, reflecting upon some kind of an online experience that, that involves some sort of protracted engagement with it. Whether it's scanning, you know, uh, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter every day, or whether it's just going back to one, you know, alt.coffee group like I did when I wrote my early coffee ethnography. Uh, it's sort of this repeat behavior where the researcher is engaged mm -hmm. and they're writing what I call immersion journal notes because there's no field. There's no single field. So it's not field notes. It's an immersion journal notes. It's the notes of your immersion. Then, I mean, you can have an auto ethnography that's just based on your immersion journal notes. That's, mm -hmm. that's certainly possible and people uh, do that. People like Liz Howard, who studies education and nursing out of uh, Isle of Wight in the UK, writes about auto ethnography and she's basing it on her her field notes, uh, uh, her immersion journal notes. Um, former student of mine studied Second Life as part of his dissertation with me. That was all immersion journals. But most people take it to this level of also collecting data that's out there, archival data, data that's around and so on. Mm -hmm. And that I state, that movement I call investigation. Mm -hmm. um, the investigation movement that's using search engines, finding content, reading through content, and then saving some of it, not all of it a much, much smaller portion of it. Otherwise you're gonna be swamped and you're gonna be overwhelmed. And then the third stage, which is really optional, is if your research question requires you to sort of understand the phenomenological reality, people need, need to report something, people's storytelling, their narratives, their self-identities, all these other things, then you move to interviewing them around what they're posting, around what they're reading, around what they're doing, around them you know, reflecting on different things, finding out, it can often help you to decode that. So your three movements there are immersion investigation and in, uh, what I call interaction. And it doesn't have to only be interviews. It can also be using a research webpage. It can be using digital diaries. It can be using mobile ethnography where you have the phone and you interrupt them, ask them questions and so on. And then that leads them to, you know, the kind of uh, analysis and interpretation that most of us in qualitative research are pretty familiar with. And then the final stage, which is to, to make real that project and answer the research questions with it. So, you know, the, you know the, a lot of the, the key innovations here happen around the, the data collection, a lot of that answer. And throughout all of it, we have to frame in each movement what the concerns are uh, uh, that are that are around research ethics. Mm -hmm. So, for example, just, just, you know, reporting your findings is not just reporting your findings. It's important to communicate appropriately, but also you have to do things like anonymize. Sometimes you're anonymizing the, the site where you found things. Sometimes you're anonymizing or pseudonymizing names. And sometimes maybe if it's a famous blogger, then you don't. Uh, so, so, you know, things change. A lot yeah. of things have to, have to change there. When do you actually cite someone using their real name for the, with their content? And mm -hmm. when do you pseudonymize them? This is, you know, this is another area where uh, analog ethnography doesn't really offer very I much help because it doesn't work that way. Yeah. Right, right. Margaret Reed didn't have to worry about, you know, someone entering a quote into a search engine and finding who the participant is. Exactly, exactly. What we call backwards tracing. It's pretty easy to find someone's pseudonyms. And we know that pseudonyms are very closely connected a lot of the times to real names. Right. And so, you know, this, this anonymity and confidentiality that we supposedly guarantee to, to our participants how does that work in the realm when we're, when we're just downloading data and playing right. with it? And, and the answer is, you know, there's a number of strategies that you can use to, to do that, uh, to, to, to ensure that. So when, when um, people are moving from that, that second stage to the third stage, so at what point w would you say, you know, you're, you're following a group or a conversation or a topic and then you think oh i'm interested in what janet's got to say i want to interview her mm -hmm. would you contact the person and negotiate consent and then then kind of work backwards a little bit to see well what did i post and then you've got you know permission to use that as well as the uh the interview you might do i mean you know one of the things about um Ethnography, like ethnography, is that everyone is emergent. So they're all different. So in some cases, in a number of cases, I would have to say, you start out studying some group. Let's say it's um, uh, female um, Indian American 
uh, professors, let's say, mm -hmm. and you want to understand their, their, their social media, their technology use habits. Well, you might not know where they are. <laughs> so the first stage might be to interview them and talk about their mm -hmm. social media habits, the, you know, what they mm -hmm. use to go online with them and see some of their messaging, find mm -hmm. out more about that. And then you would do the investigation part where you also mm -hmm. you know, sort of do, do your own observational work there. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it really depends. Um, if you're asking about procedures, there's, there's a lot of ways to contact people. Uh, generally, I don't recommend that people would sort of uh, just post to a general public forum and say, I'm looking for people, blah, blah, blah. Right, Be right. much more selective about finding someone who's interesting and DM them, maybe tell them what you're doing, uh, mm -hmm. and then maybe build a little bit of, a, of a, a relationship first before you offer that. You know, it always helps to offer someone some kind of a compensation, even if it's right. you know, just to you know, give a small gift card or something to show them that you value their time. And generally, I mean, I, I think people have been, been pretty, pretty um, fortunate in, get, in getting people to, mm -hmm. to work with them. But one of the things I write about in the latest version of the book is a lot of people are online and don't want to be researched. They don't want their mm -hmm. posts being used for research. They don't want to be interrupted while they're doing this. You know, they're, they're busy using social media for their own reasons. They're not interested in being your guinea pig. And so we really have to be very respectful of the fact that, that, that people are not there to be our uh, study subjects. Right. They are there doing what they're doing, living their lives and using these, these, these tools in that way. So we have to be very, very, we really have to tiptoe in that space and be very right. re respectful right. of that. Uh, you know, and often you know, some of the, you know, well-known uh, scandals and, you know, political situations and, you know, the highly unethical studies that have been widely publicized, you know, really make people turned off. And, yeah. you know, one of the topics that I've, you know, written a bunch about in the last year or so on method space, and I also wrote a, a book about kind of the, the role of the researcher, you know, in terms of integrity beyond simply, mm -hmm. I've gotten my ethics board or IRB to approve the study. Therefore, like um, I'm in good shape with everything taken care of. Wow. But to think, well, you know, you're, you're representing a whole kind of field. And, you know, if you, if people have, if someone has a good experience with you and thinks, oh, well, that was interesting. I feel like I contributed. It's going to help build new knowledge about, you know, this topic about the Native American, you know, professors or, you know, whatever yeah. the topic might be that you were yeah. studying and they feel good about that, that's, you know, that's going to yeah. be a, a good thing. Whereas, you know, if you are offensive or intrusive or um, make someone f feel that they've been taken advantage of, you know, then, you know, you're harming the rest of us. So, like, it's going to come back and bite people. I mean, yeah, yeah, I mean, I mean, I honestly think that, you know, there are legal gray areas now where at some point or another, some researcher is gonna step into something and, uh, and they're gonna find a lawsuit on their hands. So oh, yeah. I think we all need to be very careful and, res and respectful. It's an attitude. I, I, I like the, the, the word that you used was integrity. Working with integrity in what we do. And this is the other part of ethnography is treating people as individuals, as human beings. Mm -hmm. you know, that are, that are deserving of our, right. of our respect and admiration. Uh, and, you know, I always tell my students when they're doing this kind of work, because, you know, I do ethnography, I do, I do uh, in-person interviews uh, as a big part of my method as well. And, you know, some people would do things online that they would never think of, of doing uh, uh, in person. Mm -hmm. But to always come into these interviews, no matter what, uh, as if the person is the expert. They're the authority in their own life. They're mm -hmm. the authority in their own experience. They're right. maybe their social media experience. And you are there to learn at their need. So you need to treat that. You're not some highfalutin professor who's speaking from on mm -hmm. high. You're someone who's there to learn about other people and, and their lives. And they're the authority who can, who can teach right. you. And I think that's the right attitude. Uh, for right. us to have when we go when we go into the field because this literally does change everything when you move into the interaction mm -hmm. uh, movement in, in right. ethnography that alters everything it triggers different ethics concerns that's mm -hmm. where your informed consent has to come in now it clearly becomes human subjects research you know it, right. it alters a whole bunch of things once you do that however 
the, the payback is that it, it makes your work a lot richer and you kind of feel that you're changed in, in, in the encounter in a way that right. ethnographic work tends to change the people right. who, who do it. Right, right. I think that, you know, with the, the kind of big data or even just like you were saying, you know, earlier in the, in the immersion stage where, you know, it's so easy to to download just like you know such enormous quantities of stuff it's it's easy to forget that you know there's yeah. somebody you know behind that that you know made that post and um so you know thinking about the respect piece is really uh important so uh you know is there anything else that that uh, i know that we you know the um method space readers will be able to find more about your work and sure. we'll be including some um, posts over the course of uh, the month. Yeah. But uh, is there any uh, parting words you'd like to uh, to share today? Yeah, I mean, I think if, if you're already working on something online, uh, you know, to try to think about what a cultural approach might, mm -hmm. might be uh, to, to that topic and to think about starting an immersion journal. All it takes is opening up a PowerPoint mm -hmm. file and start uh, taking screenshots of particular pieces of data, writing down some of your thoughts and mm -hmm. your reflective notes, start keeping that immersion journal and see how it goes. Because I think um, there's just a lot of potential in the last year. We've seen this, uh, I've seen, you know, this huge um, uh, burgeoning interest in netnography because it's really all we've had left. If you were, <laughs> if you were an ethnographer, if you were, you know, planning field research and traveling somewhere. Well, you, you know, that was all canceled yeah, by COVID. Happened. And so everybody sort of turned to online. And the affordances now of things like Zoom or, you know, what we're doing right now are so good that we can really uh, come up with very, you know, uh, you know rigorous uh, 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 data from doing this kind of work. And it's, it's you know, just much easier. So I would, you know, I would say to anyone who's interested in social media as a topic, and if you're not, you probably should be uh, in most <laughs> fields, to think about a cultural approach rather than mm -hmm. one that only involves, you know, social network analysis or big data, right. which are useful for some things, right. but aren't going to reveal the, the human reality uh, right. in the way that this does. Right. Well, I, I like the way that you're you're putting the the the, the individual human the sense of culture and context, I, I think, you know, one of the pitfalls many people fall into is when they think they're going to do online research or technology oriented research, they think about the technology first rather than, you know, the question and the, the kind of human side of it. So I, I think those are some valuable uh, reminders. Well, and it's all, you know, and, and a, a further parting word is that it's, it, it's all of this too, because algorithms and AI and affordances and the aspects of, of platforms and bots and chatbots, they're changing the experience of, of, of online as well. And so as a human being moving through this, we have amazing detection capabilities that our technologies really do not. Uh, certain, you know, kind of AI, big data, scraping, and coding methods are great for certain things, but they're blind when it comes to a lot of the things that traditional ethnography does and does well. And I think that's still very relevant. And, you know, I, I, come, I come to sort of, you know, revive ethnography rather than, rather than to bury it. I think <laughs> ethnography's great strength is that it's changing and it adapted. And, and in anthropology, I think there's still this focus on, you know, these these analog ethnographies. It's really where, where a lot of the attention goes still, with a few exceptions. People like mm -hmm. Heather Horst and Danny Miller are doing really, really interesting things, but but it's few and far between, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and methodologically, there really hasn't been that much development. And yet there's so much going on in the world right now. And if we're gonna understand it, we need people out there with the right tools trying yeah. to make sense of it in, in this human contextualized way, exactly right. as you say. Okay, well, uh, thanks for taking the time to meet with me and uh, it's fun to have a chance to actually exchange <laughs> ideas after crossing paths for a long time. Definitely. Jim. And we'll uh, continue to 
think about these ideas and, and share them with the Method Space readers. I look forward to that. And thanks for all the good work you do at Method Space for everybody. I think you're, you're raising, the, raising the bar and raising the game. So that's, that's good. All right. Well, that's what we're trying to do. Thanks a lot.